Hello again, everyone, and thank you so much to all the other readers, and thank you so much to Mary Jo for writing all these incredible books that we get to select from and read poems that we want to read from. It's such a pleasure. Um, I'm going to read one poem from the last two seconds, and I'm going to read a few from the most recent book, Adolfo Throwing. So we'll start with this poem, Time Trap, The Perpetual Moment. Sandwiched between the sidewalk and an upper floor, she was drinking in an afternoon that was making her uneasy. The situation was further complicated by the proximity to the dilemma of whether to chance the unstable elevator. How else to get back to where she'd begun? It occurred to her that every dilemma goes into the river of consciousness with lipstick on a tissue, a rat in the basement, a man on the street. Meanwhile, someone was talking to her while first names kept, flash, kept flashing by in a cracked mirror whenever she blinked. Across the room, a man who looked like a younger form of Freud was saying, consciousness-wise, the doctor is no worse and no better than a novel that wants you to know every chapter once was titled, The Moment is the State Suspended. And the other ones are from this book, which is, I, I'm still kind of reeling from this book, so I kind of had to, I, I was very attracted to the poems in here when I thought about what to read for tonight. Me, a chronicle. Shapes that begin as just one solution to a common problem can go on to become an inflexible method. Take, for example, houses. Once a certain way of arranging walls takes <clears throat> hold, it's difficult to imagine any other. Another example might be locomotion, the method and circular means of moving from one place to another. I was drawn early to the idea of other modes of seeing, especially to photography. Looking back, I see myself entering the living room. I see my father crossing the room to open or close a window, my mother's zigzag pattern of static, my sister, the new century's picture-perfect child, my brother, the new century's self-possessed man. At one point, the idea of rebellion became a unified belief. I left. Can you imagine the impact? Who hasn't felt that in order to breathe, she has to splinter the first self and leave it behind? I constructed a second self. I photographed myself as if I were a building. And for those of you who know this book, and it's uh, influenced by Lucia Moholy, so she's writing a lot about this figure that, as I was saying in my talk earlier, this, this idea of the speaker as an avatar that's kind of a hybrid of this of the poet and the lyric eye and a figure such as Lucia Moholy. Um, I just find it so wonderful when we have a line like in this poem. Um, I was drawn early to the idea of other modes of seeing, especially to photography. We can see that being both Mary Jo and Lucia Moholy. You have to be uncompromising as you pass through. Although it sometimes seems random, the gawking on the street is not imagined. I see the barriers. They are there by design. Every image of a woman speaks of a theatrical body performing a script, the connector that shoulders when there's a war and embroiders when there isn't. I can see that they, meaning we, are meant to be objects small scale, fragile, unassuming. Many men see themselves as having obvious affinities with other famous men, not only from the same period, that would be banal, but from every period since time began, even Adam, even Eve. They see themselves as being more fascinating lying on a bed than the body lying beside them. She is an everyday animal of ubiquitous fabric sewn together with blue and red thread. 
a certain system that can act as a cushion at night when things are hard. Make no mistake, she is also, when things work well, an almost fully realized artwork repaying the viewer with attention. And this is the last one I'll read, The Head of a Dancer. The days when you lean your head forward, then pull your head back to see the sun is only a chrysanthemum. The eye is a white lake with a black boat moored at a particle pier that says what you want back isn't coming. The white speck says there is a light source that shines day and night far from a balcony on which an audience waits to see us open our dull eyes and close them again. I keep my face facing front to see every last thing that is coming. What is coming is this, a hat to be worn when taking a train, a compact in a pocket, a letter in a pocket, two hands, a waterfall pouring its contents into a well-worn, shuddering mind. I'm as devoted to knowing as the dim fish swimming in an ever-widening circle. Today outraced the last hour of midnight. My hat tells you that. That, and that I strangely resemble you. Eyes, nose, lips that refuse to open, knowing the face is glass and that glass can make or break you. The dog in the street pauses just as a car comes. Where does it stop? And now this, someone says. The precise line draws the bone that holds the cheek in place. The cheek waits to be kissed by air, as it was once kissed by the dark-haired boy in the boathouse, whose late-night lesson was that the distance between what had been described and what was now happening was immeasurable. The morning after, the black shoes on the shelf were married to, an, to a new, all-encompassing idea. The dress is no longer the thing the future is founded on. You put it on. You take it off. Thanks, Mary Jo. Hello. Is, that, is this too loud? No. Okay. It's echoing a lot up here. Uh, thank you so much, Mark and Aaron, for all those comments. There are so many resonances, especially with the word mentor, which will come up in what I'm about to read. Um, and thank you so much, Joel, for this incredible event. And the, this is such a wonderful thing to be able to participate in. Um, I told Mary Jo that I was going to try not to cry while trying to talk about what she means to me in front of people. So we'll see how that goes. But <sighs> OK. Um, some of what I'm going to read is a little bit more on the personal side. And that's something that is important to me to talk about in conjunction with also Mary Jo as a poet and thinker in her work. So, I came to Wash U as an MFA student in poetry in the fall of 2014. I've known Mary Jo for about four and a half years, fewer years than anyone else speaking about her today, and I'm honored to get to say a few words about her. I was turning 32 the fall I came here, and I thought of myself as more experienced in life and writing than others in my cohort because of my age. At some point, I made comments about this to both Mary Jo and Carl Phillips. And I don't remember exactly what they said, probably because I hadn't yet learned how to listen to them. <laughs> While I don't believe that a person must do an MFA in order to become a writer, I do feel now that although I wrote poems and even took writing seriously before my MFA, I became a writer in this program. I learned to write from Carl Phillips and Mary Jo Bang and from others sitting in this room, people in the workshop with me, Aaron and Justin, who were in the year above me. And one of the things I learned was that I'm still learning and that poets much younger than me often humble me with their talent, their dedication and craft, their vision. Anyway, I don't remember what Mary Jo said when I told her that I was older and more experienced than the others in the workshop. But I think I remember the look on her face, one of amusement, but also it was like she was trying to hide that she was amused so as not to embarrass me. This is one of the ways in which she's emotionally generous. 
Later, when we knew each other a little better, she would say it bluntly. You're still a baby writer, she would say. Your age doesn't matter. She was no stranger to coming to a program late with a lot of other kinds of experience under her belt. She was older while doing her MFA at Columbia than I was while doing mine here, and perhaps I didn't realize that when I made those comments. She had already studied sociology, photography, medicine. She lived many lives before she became Mary Jo Bang, the writer. Sometimes Mary Jo intimidates new students in the workshop. And here there are going to be some connections to things that Erin said, I think. Because she is very opinionated. She carries a great deal of authority, and I think sometimes she doesn't even realize that. She's incredibly poised. But as her students get to know her, it seems that she intentionally sheds this authority. Something that's happened to myself and others many times. Mary Jo will make suggestions about a poem, cuts, changes, a new title, etc. But when you make those changes and show it to her again, she'll say, this doesn't work at all. <laughs> and if you say, but I did exactly what you told me to do, she'll say, well, don't listen to me. <laughs> Over a couple of years of being her graduate student, she taught me to question myself, to challenge myself, to push myself as a writer. Then she taught me to start trusting myself. But the kind of trust I developed and am still developing involves constant questioning, seeing things from many angles, seeing possibilities for directions one can go with language and form. As with other great teachers, Mary Jo's language, the common metaphors and examples she uses in the workshop, become a common language between her students. When talking with other former students of Mary Jo's, I still refer to the red berry or the green suede glove as shorthand. The red berry relates to the idea that human beings have evolved to notice or respond to things that are surprising in both positive and negative ways, the footsteps of a predator, or the splotch of red that would alert us to the presence of sustenance. The green suede glove, something else Mary Jo talks about, refers to the fact that our brains respond to language the same way they do to experiences of the senses. The phrase green suede glove activates the same part of the brain activated by actual touch and texture. Some here may have seen that this appears in the afterword of a doll for throwing. And then there's the narcissistic mirror one of Mary Jo's many ways of talking about poetry. The poet writes in order that a reader might look into the mirror of the poem, thinking they will see the poet reflected and thereby get to know another person's intimate thoughts and feelings. And they do, but another crucial element is that what this reader sees is also themselves. The poet's work then is to create these narcissistic mirrors in which another might not only see the poet, but see themselves. Some of these lessons are ones I'm continually learning. I find myself thinking I understand a thing Mary Jo once told me, only to realize later that I hadn't understood it at all, because now, in this new moment, I think I've actually finally understood it. <laughs> and of course, that process is ongoing. The words of a brilliant person will often last throughout our lives in just this way. For me, to have Mary Jo as a mentor is to work under the sign of desire and to work both toward both authenticity and artifice. To be in relation to Mary Jo is to challenge oneself, to look oneself in the mirror. Sometimes she told me to put more of myself in my poems. Other times she told me to put more craft, more artifice into my poems, to complicate them more, to try new techniques, to break out of my routines. Once when she was looking over my work in a meeting, Mary Jo told me that I was reserved on the page. I was surprised because I thought I was forthcoming on the page. But at some point, I realized what she meant. The reason I seemed reserved was not because I was withholding something from the reader, but I was withholding something from myself. I think it's fair to say that my work started changing as my identity started changing. You could say that as I came out to myself, I also became less reserved on the page, and Mary Jo was there, a part of this process for me as a mentor, a writer, a thinker, and a friend. Mary Jo encourages her students to think about and write about and with 
desire. And this eros does not have to be about sexuality and gender, but in my case, it certainly was. I began writing about queerness and sex and gender nonconformity, and now it seems I can't or simply won't stop. Mary Jo has been so there for that. <laughs> and we've spent some hours talking about gender and sexuality because this is a subject of interest and investment for her too, and one we both like exploring through conversation. I guess what I wanna say about Mary Jo and what she's taught me about poetry is that poetry is both more and less about the writer's own life than I'd been able to conceive of before. The problems of life will often appear in one's poems, even for those who wish to consider life and writing separate. But who wishes to think like that anymore? That was always a privileged position. The speaker in the poems will have many of the same problems as the poet themselves, and dealing with a problem in one's writing may necessitate changing one's life, for there really is no place your own poetry does not see you. At the same time, of course, the techniques of writing, the potential for elasticity, for layers of meaning and language, make poetry into a dynamic language game that is far more than narrative or biographical. And the speaker is never the poet exactly, but some kind of avatar, a hybrid that is made up of the poet and the reader and Lucia Moholy or Louise Brooks. Mary Jo is a master of ventriloquism, and this is explored so gorgeously in Adolfo Throwing, but it's what she's been doing all along, and the most magical and daring moments are when she throws her voice into that narcissistic mirror with such perfect aim that it bounces back and seems to have echoed from the reader's own mouth agape. Mary Jo has an incredible mind, and I remember sitting around with my cohort at one AWP listening to poetry readings and then talking through poems we heard, and we kept asking ourselves, what would Mary Jo Bang say? We joked about getting bracelets that said WWMJBS. Mary Jo was teaching us to demand more from ourselves and from poems. After I finished the program, I would go over to Mary Jo's house or we would meet at Pi, her favorite dinner spot where we'd drink red wine and she would order a thin crust pizza with kale, mushrooms, and green olives, but the kale shouldn't be overcooked. It should go on last. It's always the same. Every time. Mary Jo talked with me through <clears throat> some of the most difficult moments in my life. And she let me know through her compassionate presence and words that no subject was off limits. Mary Jo is my friend, and I feel incredibly, incredibly lucky to have a friend who is also a brilliant poet and thinker, and who will also always be my mentor. Thank you.